Good morning, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to you as we gather together for worship. It's the second Sunday in October, and we're continuing our theme, Stronger Together. And what a privilege it is to be able to meet with you, and I pray that this uh, online service continues to be a blessing to you. Um, I've received lovely, kind comments over the last two weeks uh, of people who uh, have just appreciated the online service and uh, we want to assure you that uh, these will be continuing and we will be praying that that God continues to use them to be of great blessing to you. Our call to worship is the same as last week's um, and this week it's even more pertinent because this verse is one of many that Paul writes to the church urging them, enjoining them uh, encouraging them, instructing them, commanding them um, to to preserve the bond of peace, to preserve unity, to stay connected to one another. And we'll see from today's message that Paul speaks out of deep personal experience, having, exper having experienced a sharp dispute or a sharp disagreement. And as such, uh, our service will be one in which we consider the implications and the importance of unity within the church. And so our call to worship is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. Let's pray. Father, as we worship you together this morning, be in every home we pray. And would you let your blessing rest on us and abide with us. Use this service to strengthen our faith, to renew our hope and to draw us nearer to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's pray. Lord God, as we gather together in your name, it's with adoration and thanksgiving that we come to you. Lord, we want to praise and adore you for the great God that you are. Great in creation, great in mercy, great in faithfulness. Our stories are a testimony of your kindness and goodness to us. Our lives, a picture of your vast imagination and creativity. The cross, the ultimate story of love and, and grace and kindness. And so we praise you, great and holy God, mighty and majestic, merciful and gracious. God without beginning and God without end. Lord, you are worthy of our worship, worthy of our adoration, worthy of our praise. And we offer to you our thanksgiving, our worship. We offer to you our very lives that we might be people whose lives bring testimony to you. Lord, in this past week, we have not been all that we could have been. Forgive us for our failures and our shortcomings, for the things we've said and done and not said and not done for the number of times that our pride has got the better of us, our tongues have run away with us, our laziness has kept us back from doing the good that we could have. Forgive us, Lord. Thank you that you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, that your Spirit works in us, renewing us and making us more like Jesus. And Lord, when our, when our courage fails, give us new courage. When our strength fails, renew us. When our focus fails, call us back to you, that we might be your children in this week that lies ahead. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey kids, have you noticed so many beautiful flowers that are blossoming and blooming this spring? I came across a pattern for a paper flower called an everlasting flower and it looks like this. And let me show you how it works.
Do you see how as I roll it into itself, it keeps on making new patterns and shapes and it just goes on and on and on, always new shapes and new colors as I roll it into itself. Beautiful. Isn't that amazing? And it got me thinking about some of the things in the Bible that are everlasting and go on and on and on, like this flower. Now, of course, they're much more eternal than a paper flower. But let's think about some of those things. What can you think about in the Bible that goes on and on forever? Okay, firstly, God. God is eternal. And in, in Psalm 90, it says, Before the mountains were born, you brought forth the whole world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So that's number one. God is eternal. What else can you think about that goes on and on and on forever? God's love. You're right. And in Psalm 103, verse 17, it says, From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, who take him seriously, who have a relationship with him. And his righteousness is with their children's children. And that word righteousness makes me think of another thing that goes on and on forever. Because righteousness means right with God. Can you think what the thing is I'm thinking of? It's God's forgiveness. God's forgiveness goes on and on and on for us. And he has boundless forgiveness for us. We can come to him again and again and ask for his forgiveness. And that doesn't mean we can take it lightly and just keep on sinning. But it does mean we can come to God as often as we need to and say, Lord, please help me to get on top of this, to live a life that honors and glorifies you. And God makes us new each day and forgives us. Which is kind of like another one of my favorite verses and something that can go on forever and ever is our hope and our trust in God that will never let us down. In Lamentations chapter 3, there's this beautiful verse that says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, because his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And so we can have an everlasting hope and trust in God's faithfulness that will never let us down. Did you know that God invites us into eternal glory with him, into an internal relationship? When we become friends with Jesus, it's not just for this earth, but it's forever and ever in heaven. And God is making a new heaven and a new earth that will go on forever and ever and ever so that we can enjoy, can enjoy an everlasting relationship with God and his love. So let's thank him now. Thank you, Lord, that you are eternal, that your love goes on forever, that your forgiveness is there for us, and that you invite us into an eternal relationship with you. What a blessing and what a privilege. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. 
Lord, as we explore the story that your word will tell us this morning, would you open our hearts and use the words that I speak, that we may grow and learn. In Jesus' name, Amen. So I want to tell you a story this morning, and it's a story that starts in a home in Jerusalem. The home belongs to a lady named Mary, and her son is a, is a young man named John, or sometimes Mark. We'll call him John Mark. This home was probably the home where the Last Supper was eaten. It's probably where the day of Pentecost took place. It was the place where the church met to pray. And we read about it in Acts chapter 12 and verse 12, when Peter is miraculously released from prison and he's coming out of the prison. He goes to find the church who are praying for him. And we're told that he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Now, I want to go back a little bit before this moment to that moment where the Last Supper was probably eaten in the home of Mary. Now, imagine John Mark being a young teenager. He's heard all the stories about Jesus, the miracles, the teachings, the confrontations with the Pharisees. And now they're eating the Passover in his home. And you can just imagine that he'd watched all of that. And as the evening drew on, he was probably sent to bed. But when Jesus and the disciples depart for Gethsemane, he heads off after them. He follows at a distance, slips out of bed, and goes to see what Jesus and the disciples are doing. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane and he watches as Jesus prays and the disciples sleep. And then the unthinkable happens. Soldiers arrive. Judas betrays with a kiss. Jesus is arrested. The disciples flee. And in the midst of this, probably a rustle in the bushes, the soldiers turn and John Mark runs. And we're told that he flees the scene and they tried to grab him. And so in Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, at least 14, we read, A young man, wearing nothing but a linen garment, was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind him. Such an evocative picture, this youngster, just trying to get away as quickly as he could. And that's the story of John Mark. Years later, a man named Barnabas, who happens to be John Mark's uncle, has partnered with Paul of Tarsus, who used to be Saul, and they've planted a church in Antioch. And the church in Antioch is excited about what God is calling them to do. And Uncle Barnabas comes along and invites John Mark to go with on a missionary journey. And so the missionary journey starts. They go to Cyprus where Paul confronts Eliamus the sorcerer and the gospel is spread there. And, and then they sail to Pamphylia. And we read that at this point, John Mark abandons them. He'd started with them. He'd been their helper. But in Acts 13, we read from Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia where John left them to return to Jerusalem. Now, we don't know what the reasons were. Was it that he was scared? Was it that he was sick of being their helper? Was he homesick and overwhelmed? Whatever it is, he leaves them at this point. Paul and Barnabas carry on and they have an incredibly successful missionary journey. So successful, in fact, that they get summoned to Jerusalem where they tell the story of what God has done and they prepare to go on a second missionary journey. Let's see how that works out. Reading from Acts chapter 15. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. 
they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. What a tragic moment, a sharp disagreement, a parting of ways, a dark moment indeed. Thankfully, this is not the end of the story. A while later, Paul will write to the Colossians, and this is what he says in his closing remarks. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. And so it's very clear that John and and at least that Paul and John Mark have reconciled and by implication Uncle Barnabas must have been included in that reconciliation. And a little bit later, right at the end of his life when he's under uh, arrest in Rome and, and it's near the end of his life, Paul writes to Timothy, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Isn't that significant? Paul is asking once upon a time scaredy cat John Mark to come to Rome, where Paul is going to be martyred for his faith. And he asks that John Mark be with him and be his assistant. And it's clear that not only has the the, the relationship being healed, but John Mark is also so much more than he once was. The runaway youngster is now someone that Paul can count on, someone that Paul misses, and someone that Paul relies on. But there's one final part to the story, and it's a beautiful moment because early church tradition tells us that Peter took John Mark under his wing and that John Mark traveled with Peter and became Peter's assistant in the ministry. So much so that we believe that John Mark took Peter's sermons and compiled them into what is now the Gospel of Mark. And of course he inserted into that Gospel this little cameo of himself, not a very flattering one, but a cameo of himself running away when the soldiers tried to grab him. But John Mark ends up writing the gospel that is the foundation. Both Matthew and Luke will use Mark's gospel when they write their gospels. And Mark's gospel is the foundation of Luke and the foundation of Matthew. And so John Mark, who once was the runaway youngster, is now the John Mark who has brought a great service to the church. Help her to Barnabas. Help her to Paul. Help her to Peter, writer of the Gospel of Mark. It's a beautiful story of redemption and recovery. And so we read in 1 Peter 5 verse 13, and this is the closing comments of Peter's letter. He says, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings as does my son, John Mark. And so that rounds off the story of, of, of John Mark and the incredible way in which God is at work in his story. What is striking about the story is that it's born out of sad moments, a moment of fear and, 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 and flight and a moment of sharp disagreement. Into the story comes reconciliation. Into the story comes restoration. And this is an amazing thing. But let's dig a little deeper into this tragic moment between Paul and Barnabas. And I'm so grateful for the Bible because the Bible doesn't airbrush its characters. It doesn't kind of smooth away all the lumps and the bumps. The Bible tells us the story as it is. Because at the heart of John Mark's story 
is this incredibly tough moment. Two giants in the faith, Barnabas and Paul, Paul and Barnabas, argue. And they argue so badly that they split, they part ways. Now, you know, if there was ever a Batman and Robin in the New Testament, it would be Paul and Barnabas. And the incredible things that they did together is kind of the stuff that history is made of. And then this terrible disagreement comes and they part ways. And this happens in the church. And the Bible is just so honest about it. And if we dig into that conflict, there's so many things that we can learn from it. Because conflict is often about the things that really matter. You know, sometimes arguments are about silly things. But sometimes conflicts happen over things that matter. John Mark, a youngster needing nurture. Family. Loyalty and trust. These are vital issues and you can see both sides of the argument. Paul saying, we can't trust him and you know, what we do is life and death. You know, we were nearly stoned, we were nearly you know, thrown in prison. This is big stuff and if we can't rely on him, we can't take him with us. And, and Barnabas on the other hand saying, but how, how must a young man learn? And he's my cousin, Paul. We can't leave him behind. And so it's, it's a tough argument. It's about things that are deeply important. And so often in the church, the arguments come about things that are deeply important. Sometimes they're about silly things like the color of the curtains or which hymns we sing. But sometimes the arguments are deep and personal. And people get hurt. This argument had fallout. People were affected by it. The church in Antioch would have been affected by it. They, they had Batman and Robin as their pastors. And now Batman and Robin have fought. And they've parted ways. And Barnabas is off to Cyprus. And we know from Paul's letter to Timothy. Who is later stationed in Cyprus. That that work had continued and grown and flourished. And so they did good work there. But Paul and Silas head off on the second missionary journey. And the church is kind of torn. Who do we support? Who do we look after? John Mark is affected because he experiences rejection from Paul. And, and he watches his uncle grieve over his lost friendship. Barnabas has this devastating choice to make. Must he choose Paul? Must he choose John Mark? And just for the record, I personally believe that Barnabas was right and Paul was wrong. Barnabas chose to try and nurture a young man. He was interested in the future of the church. Paul was playing it safe. And I think as history unfolds, we see Paul's actions in kind of reconciling with John Mark and using him and being an influence in his life indicates that Paul realized his mistake in later years. But there we have it, the great Paul, possibly wrong, possibly too caught up in himself and pain and heartache ensues. In God's mercy, good comes out of this situation. And I want to say that this is truly God's mercy because it could have been that just bad came out of this. Good came out of it. John Mark was mentored. Silas was mentored by Paul. Restoration happens while both teams did good work. Both teams made a difference where they were. And eventually it seems that Paul was reconciled with John Mark and with Barnabas. And, and Paul starts mentioning Barnabas again and talking about him. And then John Mark comes to help Paul. And then John Mark helps Peter. And John Mark writes the Gospel of Mark. And so there is good that comes out of this tough argument. But that doesn't justify the argument. It doesn't justify the pain. It doesn't make it right. It's simply God's mercy and God's kindness. 
We could talk about why the argument matter happened. We could talk about pride. We could talk about agendas. We could talk about impatience. Paul was impatient with Timothy. Maybe Timothy came across arrogant and then fearful. We could talk about human failures and, and our tolerance and intolerance for mistakes and imperfections in others. We could also talk about the times that conflict doesn't heal when there's damage. Just imagine if after the breakup of Paul and Barnabas there hadn't been good work that had come out of it. Imagine if, if, if from there forwards Paul didn't really do anything significant and John Mark didn't do anything significant then this disagreement would have been so destructive and brought about so much pain and heartache. And so we need to recognize that this experience that Paul has is a defining moment for him. Because when we read his letters, and, and I did a quick search, and just a quick search, pulled up more than 20 references in the Gospels of Paul saying, at least in the letters, of Paul saying to the congregations that he looks after, get on with each other, be united, reconcile with each other, forgive one another. Here's just a few examples. In Romans 12, Paul says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. In Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, he says, finally, brothers and sisters, strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live at peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Or what about 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where Paul says, make sure nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. In Colossians, Paul says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds everything together in perfect unity. And then there's that example in Philippians where two of the ladies in the congregation are in an argument. We don't know what it was, but they're in an argument. And Paul says, I plead with you, O dear, and I plead with Syntyche, agree with one another in the Lord. And then finally, in Ephesians 4.32, and remember our call to worship was from the start of Ephesians chapter 4. This is now the end of Ephesians chapter 4. So the, 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 the chapter is topped and tailed with calls to unity. Paul says this, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So let me conclude. The church is not immune from egos, pride, and potential disagreements. The church is made up of human broken, be human, broken human beings. And there's always the possibility of disagreements and disunity, heartache and pain. These can be incredibly painful. They can be devastating to us. Paul, having learnt some tough lessons, tells us that we should strive to avoid them, that we should work for unity, and that when heartache happens, we should forgive and reconcile, even if it takes time. And then we should note that God in His mercy sometimes brings good out of pain. But that makes no excuse for the pain. Who knows if Batman and Robin had stayed together, if Paul and Barnabas had stayed together, they might have done even greater things. And so 
we should strive at all costs to maintain the unity of the church. And Paul, seem, it seems to be a theme that is embedded so deeply in him. And maybe that's what he learned from that horrible fight that he and Barnabas had, that he just didn't want the church to go through that. And so we look after each other. We forgive one another. We bear with one another. We look after each other. We look out for one another. We preserve the peace. We stifle the gossip. We protect our unity. We defend those who aren't present. And we do whatever it takes to keep the family of God together. Because this, at the end of the day, is why Christ died. So that we can be restored to one another. That we can get on with one another. That we can forgive one another. And in so doing, bring glory to his name. Amen. Lord, you call us to be one. You call us to care for one another, to be united with one another, to be your people together. The reality is that our disagreements, our pride can separate us. Help us, Lord, to avoid these situations by doing what is right. And Father, where these situations have happened, where we've been hurt, maybe in the past somewhere, help us to forgive. And where there are situations right now where people find themselves divided, would you help them to restore, help them to recover, help them to renew, for we ask it in your name, remembering that you died so that we could be one. Amen.
While we can't take up a physical offering, we can still respond to God's word and goodness by offering ourselves. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are our provider of so many good and wonderful things. We are grateful every day for all the blessings you bestow on us. We pray that our tithes, as well as our time and our talents offered, may be pleasing and acceptable to you. Please use us and guide us to do your kingdom work here on earth. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Dear Lord, we worship you as our holy Lord. We thank you for who you are, our holy Lord and loving Father, who is forever faithful, constantly loving and forever present. You are the source, the means and the purpose of all things. We thank you, Lord, for what you mean to us. We thank you for what you do for us. You meet all our spiritual and physical needs. You are our rock, our fortress, our light and our ever-present help. We thank you for our families, homes, work, food and clothes. We thank you for all the individuals, wider communities and organisations who are reaching out to spread your love and message. Thank you for the practical help, food and clothes that are distributed. May our prayers be a source of encouragement for them. May their work be blessed with abundance and be a blessing to those they assist. Lord, your ways are not our ways, and we don't understand your plans. So our prayer for all nations is asked in faith. We pray that all nations will come to know you as Lord, so that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. As we pray for all nations, we remember to pray for all leaders and governments. We ask that they will submit their decisions to you, so the world will see your hand in everything they do. We pray that your Spirit will prepare our hearts and make us willing, so when you ask whom shall I send, we'll be ready to spread your word and love and make disciples of all the nations. May our hearts be acceptable temples for your Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been a great privilege to be with you and this message that we have heard today is an important one. If you've ever been part of a church fight, you know how painful it is. And so let's observe this reminder. We need to pray 
for the unity of the church. We need to strive for the unity of the church. We need to make every effort, every effort to maintain our peace and unity, that we do all that we can to create a fellowship that is warm and caring, protective and safe. As we go into this week, I do pray that you'll experience the beauty and love of, of Christian community as you interact with fellow Christians and friends. I also want to remind you that our, this coming Sunday is going to be our day of giving. And this is an important Sunday in our calendar. It's the day that we recognize God's faithfulness and His goodness to us. And in response, we offer a gift of ourselves and of our treasure in the service of the King. If you're unable to join us physically, uh, we will have something of the Day of Giving in our online service as well. If you'd like to make a contribution to the church, I, I will put the banking details on screen now and I'd invite you just to make a contribution for the church as your Thanksgiving offering. You might want to say thank you Lord for these online services and if you do that please mark your contribution day of giving or just DOG day of giving that uh, Craig and the team will know that that's what the money is for. If you are able to join us we'll be having uh, chicken burgers after the service and there is a link that you can uh, go and sign up for and book the number of burgers and the number of people. I'll be sending that out on WhatsApp and on email, um, but do come and join us if you can for a very special day. And uh, we'll be eating burgers by about quarter past 11. Uh, we'll also have a, a little magic show being done by Andrew for the kids and hopefully get some French cricket or something like that on the go as well. So families, this will be a day for you come and join us and be part of something really special. And so go into this week. Love and serve the Lord. Protect your brothers and sisters in Christ. And let's be a light to the world. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us now and forevermore. Amen. And here are the birthdays and anniversaries at Emmanuel this week. Today being Sunday the 13th, it's Joanne, Kevin, Emma who turns 21, and Christopher who is turning 16. On Monday the 14th, it's Diane and Tandile. On Tuesday the 15th, Jamie and Tessa, and Tessa will be 20 years old. On Thursday the 17th, it's Ntokozo. And then on Friday, we have Ryan, Bridget, Erica, and Saturday the 19th, we have Amy. The anniversaries this week, on Sunday the 13th, which is today, Jade and Llewellyn will be married 12 years. Let us pray for these folk. May each person know that God knows, hears, and sees them. May their birthdays and anniversaries be blessed with family, friends, love, and care. We pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation.
that they may know him better. Amen.